this morning, we're going to be continuing our lesson, our verse-by-verse study of 2 Thessalonians. And last week we ended chapter 1, and this morning we're going to be continuing on in chapter 2. I've titled today's message, A Timeline of Final Events. If you look at the world around us and see what's been happening out there in different parts of, or different cities, different states, you see that things are looking pretty bad. It's very easy to, to see that a lot of people are calling evil good, and they're calling good evil. There's a lot of voices out there that are also saying we are living right now in the end times. But as today's study will show us that that's not necessarily true. So I hope that today's message, what I, well, I, one of the things I hope it does is, is, uh, is clarify some things. So that way you're aware, you know what's really going on what to look forward to, what to be on the lookout for. Now, before I go into today's, into today's message, um, I just want to briefly, just briefly, um, look at the, some of the things that Paul covered in that first chapter of uh, his second letter to the Thessalonians. Now, he began by thanking God for what the Thessalonians have done, and told them that he was praying that God might accomplish what God might accomplish. He was praying for what God might accomplish through them in the future. He then touched on how their persecution and trials were the result of living for Christ and the gospel in a hostile world that rejects God and his love. Now, regarding persecution, Paul went on to explain how it relates to the justice of God. Now, from what it appears in chapter 2, verse 2, there may have been some believers in the, that church there in Thessalonica who were persuaded that the day of the Lord had already arrived. Paul responds by correcting their misunderstandings and then informs them that the justness and righteousness and the rightness of God's judgment will become evident to all at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven. And then he closed that last part of chapter 1 by letting the Thessalonian, his Thessalonian brothers and sisters know what his prayers are. He prayed that in spite of the current sufferings, that they might live lifestyles that were consistent with their calling and their destiny, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified by you and you by him, according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. So now as we get into chapter 2, Paul will continue to clarify any further confusion concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the day of our Lord and the day of the Lord. Now, as we've already seen, the saints, the believers there in Thessalonica, they were suffering severe persecution. Severe persecution. Some were saying that this persecution was proof that the tribulation had already begun. They were seeing all this stuff going on around them. And they were saying the same thing some of us, some Christians are saying. We must be living in the end times. This must be it. Furthermore, rumors were floating around that Paul himself believed and taught that the day of the Lord had arrived. So here now, he will set the record straight. He will get right to it. Again, as believers, this next section of this letter is important. It's important because it's going to help you to discern false teachings regarding 
the Lord's return. Paul will show us here that the, that that day it's not going to arrive until certain other events take place. And he's also going to tell us the prophetic events that make up God's timetable. That's why I've titled today's message a timeline of final events. So let's pray and before I read, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us powerfully this morning. Heavenly Father, we are, we're so thankful that you have us here and you've brought us all here together, Lord. We truly do love you, Lord, and pray that you will speak to us powerfully now through your word. We thank you for the words that you gave Paul, for leading him, guiding him to write the words that we're about to read. It will give us more of a clearer picture of what to expect, what to look for. For your arrival. I pray that these, these words will bring clarity, not confusion. I pray that you will use me as your instrument to speak truth. That lives will change, Lord, as a result. That you will lead them to, this, to the cross of Jesus Christ. I know you're going to do something powerful. Not here, somewhere out there, Lord, whoever's watching this. So do your work, Lord. Keep us safe. Fill this room with your spirit, Lord. We love you, praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. First Thessalonians, I mean, Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. If I've been saying First Thessalonians, forgive me, we're in Second Thessalonians. Thessalonians. All right, now, there's a lot here that Paul is saying, and I'm going to try to cover it as much as I possibly can, but for now, I'm just going to read the first verse because I want to touch on a few things regarding that verse. And there, Paul writes, well, the Word of God says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled either by prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly, supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. In the New Living Translation, verse 1 reads like this. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify. And again, he's speaking about himself Sylvanus and, and Timothy. Let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. As a brother in the Lord, Paul implores his readers, his brothers and sisters in Christ, against believing the false teaching that, would sh that was shaking their spiritual equilibrium and triggering their fears. Apparently, the theory that they were in the day of the Lord was coming to them from several sources. Some were saying that this teaching had been revealed to them by the Lord. They got a prophetic word. Some were reporting that this is what they heard being taught by other teachers, other pastors. And apparently they received a letter that was allegedly from Paul that taught that same error. And so because of these sources, the Thessalonians were inclined to accept it as authoritative. So you can see how it's, it's not any wonder how those new converts were 
easily shaken by what they were hearing. Is this, are we really living in the end times? Is this really happening? The erroneous message which all these voices echoed was that the day of the Lord had arrived. The Thessalonians were in it. But if this was so, the believers were wondering how could Paul speak of the Lord's return as preceding the day of the Lord? And what about those promises that they wouldn't see God's wrath? Now it's clear that Paul, while he was with them, he taught them a pre-tribulation rapture. However, the reason they were so confused was because they couldn't distinguish their present troubles from those of the day of the Lord. So after, after having stated the issue and identified the source of the false teaching, Paul proceeded to warn his readers against being deceived. This is true for all of us as well. As Christians, as followers of Christ, we mustn't allow ourselves to be deceived by anyone. We mustn't allow the false teachers that are out there to confuse us, to shake our foundation, to scare us, to trigger a fear in us. It doesn't matter how credible they might appear to be or even how they might present their teaching. Claiming the authority, by, even if they claim to have the authority of God, or that they are prophets and seers and whatever other title they want to use, don't let their appearance, even if they're dressed in Armani suits and, and are, you know, have that chiseled look and, you know, don't listen to what they're saying. Pay attention to what they're actually saying. The Bible tells us that new Christians tend to be gullible because they're not yet grounded in the truth of God's word. All of us, if we're honest, we know that while we were younger, young in our faith as Christians, yeah, we made a lot of mistakes. We were gullible. We didn't know a lot. But as time went on, we did. We started, as I reread our Bibles and went into Bible studies and you know, started going to church, go, you know, being in prayer, spending more time with the Lord, things became more apparent. We learned, we grew. We didn't make those same mistakes. We weren't as gullible. But here's the thing. The truth is this. All Christians, if we're not caref careful, can be misled by impressive personalities and spectacular appeals. False teachers and, and their false teaching are, as Romans chapter 3, verse 13 puts it, their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Vipers' venom is under their lips. But, my friends, the antidote to poisonous heresy is a strong dose of the truth which Paul proceeded to administer. And here, I want to read the rest of our passage. We see what's going on. Continuing on in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse... Uh, I'll just start over. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gather, gathered to Him... We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled 
either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. That day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. A man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Do you remember that when I was still with you, I, I, when I was still with you, we used to tell you about this. And you know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. But the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's work, working with all con kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will, not, so that they will believe the lie and that all will be condemned. So that all will be condemned. Those who did not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. Now he lays out three, three, three things that are going to happen. The apostasy. Now these aren't in specific order. He's just mentioning them. But again, I'll get into that in just a minute. The apostasy, the rapture, and the revealing of... The Lord comes, the revealing of Jesus. So again, without hesitation, Paul gets right into the topic that was causing confusion, confusion and anguish among some of the believers in Thessalonica. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our, our being gathered to him. What is he speaking of here? What is he talking about? Well, speaking here of the rapture. In his previous letter, Paul taught them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that the Lord would return and catch up his own to meet him in, meet him in the air. And so by stating verse 1 in the way he did, he accomplished three things. He's referring them back to what he already taught them in his first letter, he is responding to their question regarding the topic. And he's also re-clarifying that this supernatural event, this event, the rapture, isn't two separated events, but one great event that will happen suddenly and without warning. See, once the church is out of the world, Satan and his forces will unfold their program. It will be a time of tribulation for people on earth. It'll be the worst time mankind has ever seen. Satan and his hosts will be working on earth, and God will send righteous judgments from heaven. Now, if you want to know more about this period, I refer you to, I recommend reading Revelation chapter 6, verse to, uh, chapter 6 to chapter 19. That will give you some more insight as far as what I'm speaking of here. Now, if you're wondering why Satan is unable to reveal his man of lawlessness right now, or why he hasn't been able to do it sooner. 
It's because God is restraining the forces of evil in the world today. You think things are bad out there? What you're seeing in the news and on social media? That's just the tip of the iceberg. It's going to get much worse when the man of lawlessness, when God's restraining forces are set aside and when the evil takes over. You see, Satan can't do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it, whenever it pleases him. No, you can't do that. God right now is restraining him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, in, in what we just read, Paul mentioned a restraining force that even today is helping keep everything in schedule. Who or what is this restrainer? Well, according to verse 5, Paul told the Thessalonians, he told them, he told the Thessalonians when he was with them personally, but he doesn't necessarily mention it specific, mentions it specific, or mentions him specifically, or he doesn't put this affirmation here in his letters. Regardless, though, he says in verse 7 that the restrainer is now at work in the world and will continue to do so until he is out of the way. Now, there's one thing I want you to notice here. Notice that Paul referred to this restrainer in the masculine gender. He. This implies that the restrainer is actually a person who is today the one now remaining, but will one day be taken out of the way. So this restrainer is in a female. It's a male. It's a male person. Now, many Bible students, teachers, pastors, identify this restrainer as the Holy Spirit of God, the third person, person of the Trinity. Now certainly, he is in the midst of God's program today, working through the church to accomplish his purposes, working through individuals that has taken up his calling, have taken up his calling to, to accomplish his will and purpose. Now, there's also something I want you to be clear about. This doesn't mean by saying this, by saying that one day he's going to be taken out of the way, doesn't mean that when the church is raptured, the Holy Spirit is going to be taken out of the world. It's going to be completely taken out of the world. No. Let me explain. He'll be present on earth during the great tribulation because according to Revelation chapter 7 and chapter 14, many will be saved, sealed, and serve God during this period. And the Bible clearly tells us that this can't happen without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thus, what he's saying here is that he's going to be taken out of the way. He's going to step aside. He won't be removed. He's going to, be stepping, he's going to step aside to allow Satan and his forces to go to work. Now, I will get to this in a bit, but I warn you or anyone that may be thinking, well, then I'll become a Christian during the tribulation period. I'm just going to live my life right now and see what happens. Well, as we'll see in just a bit, it doesn't work that way. You know, this, this Satan working with the Antichrist, his, his minions, are going to bring such a great deception 
that even people who thought were Christians or wanted to be Christians or thought they can get away with that will be deceived. Again, I'll get to that in just a minute. Also, I want to mention this. In spite of its weakness and seeming failure, never, ever underestimate the importance of the church in the world today. People who criticize the church, who say, oh, it's just a bunch of crazy people. We don't need the church. We can do church by ourselves at our, in our living room or in my living room watching TV or watching the internet in my bedroom. Those, those are crazy people. I, I, they don't realize, don't realize that the presence of the people of God in this world, God's people being gathered together in a congregational way, in a meeting together, it gives unsaved people an opportunity to be saved. People, again, let me repeat that. People who criticize the church don't realize that the presence of the people of God in this world gives unsaved people an opportunity to be saved. The presence of the church is delaying the coming back, the coming of judgment. Lot you know who Lot is, right? Lot was not a dedicated man. But his presence in Sodom, it held back the wrath of God. There are right now two programs at work in the world today. God's program of salvation and Satan's program of sin. The mystery of iniquity. God has a timetable for his program and nothing, nothing Satan does can change that timetable. Just as there was a fullness of the time for the coming of Christ, so there will be a fullness of the time for the appearance of the anti Antichrist and nothing at all will be off schedule. Everything will be according to schedule. Once the restraining ministry of the Spirit of God has ended, the next event can take place. Now, as you can see, Paul didn't use the term Antichrist in, here in this letter. But that's the name we use to identify the last great world dictator whom Paul designated as the man of lawlessness in verse 3. You see, church, Satan has been at war with God since he, as Lucifer, rebelled against God and tried to capture God's throne. He tempted Eve in the garden and through her caused Adam to fall. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God declared war on Satan and his family seed and promised the coming of a Redeemer who would finally and completely defeat Satan. Satan not only opposes Christ, but he wants to be worshipped and obeyed and obeyed instead of Christ. And one day, one day, he's going to produce his masterpiece, the Antichrist, who will cause the world to worship Satan and believe Satan's lies. As I mentioned before, Paul had explained that all of, the, all of this, he had explained all of this to the believers in Thessalonica. He was referring to them, no doubt, 
um, the, relevant, the relevant scriptures in the Old Testament. He taught them what it said about this figure, this Antichrist, or, yeah, this Antichrist. He showed them this through the scriptures in the Old Testament. Well, now, here today, as believers in the 21st century, we're fortunate to have an entire Bible to study. So I'm going to share with you just a few th things that are characteristics or um, I want to paint basically, get a picture of, uh, give you a picture of what the Antichrist, who he is and what he's all about. Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 says that he would be a peacemaker, the peacemaker. Certainly this man will be on the scene before the rapture of the church. People will probably know about him. He's going to be, he probably is around right now. He will be a peaceful political leader who unites 10 nations of Europe into a strong power block. The rider on the white horse from Revelation chapter 19 imitates Christ. He goes forth to conquer peacefully. But what is he holding? He has a, he has a bow, but no arrows. This man, this person, will bring a brief time of peace into the world before the storm of the Lord, before the storm of the day of the Lord breaks loose. Now Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27 says he'll be known as a protector. Now I can't examine the exciting, all the exciting details of this prophecy, but it's important to note several facts. First, this prophecy applies to Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple, and not to the church. Second, it announces the time when the Messiah will come and accomplish certain purposes for the Jewish people. The word weak refers to a period of seven years. Seventy weeks are equal to 490 years. Again, note that these 490 years are divided into three parts. Seven weeks, or 49 years, during which the city would be rebuilt. Sixty-two weeks, or 434 years, at the end of which, which time Messiah would come and be cut off. One week or seven years during which a prince would have a covenant with Israel. Again, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, it says two princes are involved in this prophecy. Christ, Messiah the prince, and Antichrist, the prince that shall come. The people of the prince that shall come, some believe, are the Romans. For it is they, it was the Romans who destroyed the city and the temple in AD 70. Finally, note that there's a gap. There's a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. We're living in that gap right now. The, that there is the church age. The 69th week ended with the ministry of Christ. The 70th week will start with the arrival of the Antichrist. This Antichrist, he will make a covenant with Israel to protect her and to permit her to rebuild her temple. And this covenant will be for seven years. He will temporarily solve the Middle East crisis that no one has been able to solve since 
it became a nation. Israel, we build her temple in peaceful times. It's the signing of this covenant, not the rapture of the church, that signals the start of Daniel's 70th week, that seven-year period known as the day of the Lord. That's when you can start, someone living at that time can start their watches. Start counting seven years. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 says that he'll be the peace breaker. After three and a half years, the Antichrist will break his covenant with the Jews and take over their temple. This was what Paul termed the apostasy in verse 3. A better translation would be the rebellion or the falling away. Up to this point, Antichrist has been a peacemaker, peacemaker leader of 10 European nations obligated to protect Israel. But now he reveals his true character by taking over the Jewish temple, that newly rebuilt Jewish temple, and demanding, demanding that the world worship him. And since this Antichrist will be energized by Satan, it's no surprise he will seek worship. He's going to seek it. Why is that? Because Satan has always wanted the worship of the world. There have been several various apostasies in church history when groups have turned away from God's truth. But this final rebellion will be the greatest the greatest of all apostasies. This man of lawlessness, this man of sin, will oppose everything that belongs to any other religion, true or false. He will organize the world church that will, by worshiping him, worship Satan. Our Lord Jesus predicted this apostasy he called it the abomination of desolation in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. The world will wonder at this great leader who, with Satan's power, will perform signs and wonders and deceive the nation, the nations. It's so easy to fool people Nowadays, people that are looking for something supernatural, out of the ordinary, something that will boggle their minds, something that, again, they can film and, and post on social media and, and go viral and people will believe it. It's crazy, but yes, this Antichrist is going to be doing all these signs and wonders and deceive people who thought they couldn't be deceived. Who right now are saying, you know what, I'll know. I'll know when I, I'll, you know, I don't need to be a Christian right now. I'll be a Christian later on. And I'll know who the Antichrist is because he's going to, again, if you don't have Christ in your heart, if you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you, and you haven't surrendered to him, going to be hard not to be deceived by this fool, this antichrist. It's going to deceive the nations. Revelation chapter 13, 15 through 17 says this lawless one will be the persecutor. Most prophetic students agree that the abomination of desolation will occur three and a half years after the Antichrist makes his covenant with the Jews. This will usher in a period of intense persecution and turbulation 
Jesus even said in Matthew 24, 21, for then shall be, for then shall be great tribulation. At that time, Satan, the devil, will vent his wrath against Israel. He will so control the economic system that citizen, citizens must bear the mark of the beast to be able to buy and sell anything and everything. People often ask, will anybody be saved during a seven-year period? The answer is yes. Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 8 states that 144,000 Jews will be saved, probably as the Apostle Paul, uh, as, probably as was the Apostle Paul in a very dramatic vision of Christ. That's again, it's not specific here, it doesn't say, it's just a guess, probably. But again, uh, it's going to be as dramatic as what Paul went through. And they will carry out the gospel to the nations. The Apostle John described a great multitude of Gentiles who will come out of the great tribulation there in Revelation chapter 7. These are the converted people. Again, even though the Holy Spirit will be out of the way as a restraining power, He will still work with redeeming power. However, it's going to cost dearly to trust Christ and to live as a Christian, to live for Him during that time. Christians, believers who refuse to bow down to the beast's image will be killed. They'll go after them and they will be killed. It will, those who refuse to get that mark of the beast are going to be unable to get jobs, to buy food, to do anything in that world economy. That will be severe persecution. Families will be pointing fingers at them. Friends will come after them. People who they thought they were friends will come after them. The government will come after their children. But again, it's going to be a lot of debts. A lot of debts. It's going to be quite a contrast to our situation right now. It's going to be a big difference. Finally, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21 says that he'll be the prisoner. Keep in mind again, that God has a timetable. Satan will not be permitted to control the world forever. Jesus Christ will return in power and great glory and take Antichrist and his associates prisoner and also Satan and cast them, as Revelation chapter 20 says, into the bottomless pit. This will be the climax of the great battle of Armageddon, during which the nations of the world unite with Satan to fight Jesus Christ. Read that, that chapter there in Revelation, Revelation chapter 16. People will actually be fighting against Christ. It's crazy to think about. They think they can fight him when he returns. Well, this leads to our next event, the return of Jesus Christ. 
This is his, re his return to the earth in glory and judgment. The event is described in verses 5 through 10, and 5 through 10, or the First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. It will occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation period when the mystery of iniquity, Satan's evil program, will have ended with the battle of Armageddon. It's important, though, that we distinguish the rapture of the church from his return to the earth. The first event is unknown. It's a secret. No one knows the time or the day when that will occur. No one will know when believers, the church, all true believers will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, in the twinkling of an eye. The second event is public. When the church returns with him to defeat Satan and his hosts. In verses 8 and 9, we read about Jesus' judgment of the Antichrist. Nobody on earth will be able to overcome the Antichrist and his forces. Why? Because, again, he's empowered, energized by Satan himself. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4 says, Who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war against it? According to verse 9 in our passage, Satan will enable this false Messiah to perform every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders, serving the lie. This, of course, is an imitation, is an imitation of Jesus Christ who performed miracles and wonders and signs. See, church, Satan has always been an imitator. He's always been an imitator. There are false Christians in the world who are really children of the devil. He has false ministers who preach a, fal a false gospel. There is even a synagogue of Satan which means a gathering of people who think they're worshiping God, but who are really worshiping the devil. These false Christians have counterfeit righteousness that is not the saving righteousness of Christ. They have a false sense of assurance or a false assurance of salvation that will prove useless when they face judgment. Are you guys aware that Satan can perform miracles that seem to rival those of the Lord? Yes, this is how he opposed Moses in the court of Pharaoh. In the final judgment, some people who performed miracles in the name of Jesus will be rejected by the Lord because they were never saved. Or Judas performed miracles, yet he was never born again. The purpose of God's miracles was to lead people to the truth. The purpose of the Antichrist's miracles will be to lead people to believe his lies. Paul called them wonders serving the lie, not because the miracles are not real, but because they persuade people to believe the lies of the devil. When Jesus Christ returns, verse 8 says that he will judge the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth and the appearance of his coming. As the coming of the Lord for his church draws near, Satan's operations in this world will intensify. We see glimpses of it now, what that's going to look like 
if you think the things are evil now, things are bad now, it's only going to get, as I said earlier, much, much worse. Right now he's preparing, he's setting things up. If you think it's horrible, it's bad that children are getting groomed by pedophiles, to getting taught in schools that it's okay to mutilate their bodies and not tell their parents. It's going to set, all that setting things up for things that are going to get much worse. We know there's already groups out there that are advocating for adults to have legal relationships with kids. Sickening, sickening. There's images out there, kids changing their gender and then dancing in front of men, marrying off, you know, as kids. Horrible things are happening out there. And again, these are just glimpses, and, this, and Satan is just preparing the world for what's to come. Again, it's going to be, things are only going to intensify. Since Satan is a liar, we as Christians must resist, resist him through the truth of God's word. It was this sword that our Lord used when he defeated Satan in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. Christian, brother and sister in Christ, Satan is a liar and a murderer. God gives life through his truth. Satan slays with his lies. We're encouraged to know that one day Jesus will completely overthrow Satan and his system. In the last two, three verses, we're told about his judgment, Jesus' judgment of the unsaved. Again, we've known of a great number of Jews and Gentiles are going to be saved during the seven-year tribulation period. But the, mass, the, the vast majority of the world's population will be lost. Many will die in the terrible judgment that God will send on the earth. Again, you can read about that in Revelation chapter 6, 8, 9, and 11. Others will perish in judgment when Christ returns and separates the saved from the lost. But it's important to note, note that these people did have the opportunity to believe and be saved. See, God has no delight in judging the lost. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. These people will be judged and will suffer forever, for all of eternity, because they wouldn't receive and believe the truth. In fact, their hearts will be so evil that they will not even have any love for the truth. Those who love lies and make, lie, and make lies will be excluded from the heavenly city and, be, and will be sent to the lake of fire. In this paragraph, Paul taught a sobering truth. A person can so resist the truth that he finally becomes deluded and has to believe a lie. There can't be no, there can be no neutral ground. Ground. Either we believe the truth or we believe a lie. Either you believe the truth or you believe a lie. To reject truth means to receive the lie. 
Does this mean that God is to blame, blame for, God, for a man's rejection of Christ? Well, no. No more than God was to blame for Pharaoh's spiritual condition when Moses was bringing the plagues to Egypt. Pharaoh heard God's word and saw God's wonders, yet he refused to bow to God's will. Pharaoh occasionally, he relented and gave lip service to God's will, but he always resisted in the end and refused to obey God. Read the story and you'll see what I'm talking about. He hardened his heart so much that he couldn't believe the truth and this led to God's final judgment in the land of Egypt. Verse 11 in our chapter reads literally that they should believe the lie. What is the lie? Well, Satan is a liar and has foisted many deceptions on the human race. But there is one lie from the beginning, from the very beginning that has led people astray. Remember what it is? He spoke... He spoke it to Eve there in the garden. You shall be as God. You shall be as God. The lie is the idea that man is his own God and therefore can do whatever he pleases and better himself by his own human efforts. Let me rephrase that. The lie is that God, the, Satan's lie is him telling you that you're your own God. And you're better off doing whatever you think is right. To be dictated by your feelings, what your feelings are telling you is right. You can better yourself by your own human efforts. just thinking about it. What do you call that? What people are doing? Manifesting it. You're not your own God. You're not your own God. You're not even close. You're dirt. You really know who you truly are compared to God you will understand, you will know that you're nothing. You're scum. Guess what? Jesus died on the cross to make you holy and righteous. To forgive you so now that you, so that you can stand before God in righteousness and holiness. get that I get to that again at the end here Romans tells us Romans 125 says um, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator that's the literal translation there all of which means that Satan's appeal Satan appeals to Man's pride. He he will appeal. He appeals to your pride. It was pride that turned Lucifer into Satan. It's pride that traps men into doing Satan's will in the world. The people of Christ will judge not not only to do the people of Christ will judge not only um, the people Christ will judge not only do not love the truth, but as verse says, verse 12 says, they have delighted in unrighteousness. Read Psalm 50 for one description of this kind of person. Also Psalm 52. 
According to Mark 14, the chief priests were actually glad when Judas promised to help them kill Christ. I mentioned before that this process of believing the lie is described in Romans 1. The closing verse of that section there in Romans 1 verse 32 states the truth clearly. Although they knew God, know God's just sentence that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. So does this mean that those who have heard the gospel before the rapture of the church cannot be saved after the rapture? Not necessarily. If that were true, then our witness to the lost is condemning them should Christ return. However, it does mean that no lost sinner can afford to treat God's truth carelessly or reject God's Son repeatedly. You just can't keep doing it over and over and over again, saying, you know what, not now. I'm going to live my life. I'm having such a good time. I'm living the best. Look at all the money I'm making. Look at this, you know, look at this relationship I have. And look, I've got it all now. I don't have time for religion. I don't have time for God. I don't have time for Christ. And they keep doing it over and over. And again, as they do that, what they're really doing is hardening their hearts to the point where they just, it's too late. The human heart becomes harder each time the sinner reject, rejects God's truth. And this makes it easier, easier and easier to believe Satan's lies. So let me ask you, have you received the truth? Do you know the truth? Are you willing to surrender to that truth? Or are you going to once again reject that truth and say, no, not right now? Yes. All of you know, we, I know from experience what that means. I may mean you will lose friends. You may not do some of the things that you wanted to do. But it doesn't mean your life is over. It doesn't mean that God isn't going to lead you to more righteous paths. He has a plan for all of you. He has his perfect plan and all he wants you to do is to follow it. It's not going to be easy at times, but if you just follow God's plan, if you follow what his plan is for your life, man, when you see him face to face on that day, he's going to tell you, come here, I'm a good and faithful servant. Welcome to your new home. Again, I ask, have you received the truth? If you haven't, and you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, don't, again, don't let another day pass. God's been, some of you, God has been calling you. God has been tugging at your heart. It's time now to just surrender. It's time to just say, Lord, yes, okay. I don't know how, I don't know what, but I know you're going to help me through this. If you're ready to surrender at the cross, I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus. But you must pray it sincerely. He knows what's deep in your heart. He knows whether you're saying it sincerely or if you're just saying it to please others, to make yourself look good. So wherever you're at, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died 
for my sins and rose from the dead. And I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Savior. Thank you for saving me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.